whether we are addicted to aid pakistan mein 203 billion dollars aaye hain jitne humne repayments kiye hain dollar mein usme 50 billion dollar ka fark aata hai it's a net resource transfer from pakistan to outside 27 ya 28 dafa imf ke paas gaye kabhi iski effectiveness nahi study ki gayi it's a shortcut ki aap khud apni belt tightening nahi karte aapko bahar se resources mil rahe hain what do you do with that aid aid has a positive impact when the recipient country has a plan pakistan needs to be in the position of strength where it can tell its donors we don't want you if you're not going to get behind our develop, development vision agreements that we sign they are not public i have never seen any cpec agreement being public aid is not a solution to all of pakistan's problems Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much for uh, uh, joining this, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, doctor, after what Doctor Nadeem Ulak said, I don't think uh, there is a lot to be said in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the main theme of this conference. उन्हें आगे ही बहुत कुछ कह दिया है. तो just as an introduction, uh, my name is Shahid Mahmood. I am a research fellow at PIDE, and one of the research areas that I am uh, pursuing right now is foreign aid and its effectiveness uh so uh, its findings are going to come out very shortly and it's not a short term finding we've gone over the foreign aid inflows and it's uh, tried to gauge its effectiveness over the longer term so it will be out in the form of a booklet shortly inshallah taala and it will be free for all of you to read as are all the pied publications that are uh, there on their website so just as a starter uh, we have our panel uh, 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 with which we'll discuss this uh, issue in detail our panelist uh, i'm going to discuss this i'm going to be asking questions and obviously you would be involved too and you would be asking questions too but let me first start by sharing some of the findings uh, it, it's kind of a summary i'm just sharing the main statistics jo kuch jise aap kehte hain na ki starter jo tadka lagane wale hai so let's get you started it will awake you acha kuch ye aap logo ke sath main kuch hi finding share kar raha hu ke dekhe we have been addicted to it uh jaise ki dr nadeem ne kaha aapko abhi ek unhone cartoon bhi dikhaya tha that goes back to 1950s ke wahan se aid ka ek silsila shuru hua so pakistan has been addicted to aid pakistan has been receiving aid inflows since the very start but does anybody know not many in fact know ki kitni aid aayi hai abhi tak so if you uh, i'll just give you one uh, statistics if you exclude the foreign inflows the ones uh, that we receive through uh, for example the euro bond inflows jo ke euro bonds hum float karte hain unke inflows aate hain agar aap usko exclude kar de to since independence at least since 1950 pakistan mein 203 billion dollars aaye hain and 640 million the total inflows have been Uh, cumulative if you account for all of those those come to around 203 billion and 640 million dollars since 1950 that's a lot of aid that's a lot of money that's not a small amount so uh, uh, other than that and of those uh, of course aid is not just a ek simple inflow hota hai there are various types of aid usme jo aid hai usme loans bhi hote hain usme grants bhi hote hain 177 billion dollars of this money is purely loan ye loan hai aur agar aap usko sirf 2 faisad pe bhi wo kare which is a very conservative estimate ye kafi paise bante hain jo ki humne wapas kiye and i'll share that information with you phir a large a large portion of these inflows are for projects of which a substantial portion of our tied nature projects ki aid jo hoti hai usme tied bhi hote hain untied bhi hote hain लेकिन बड़ी एक अमाउंट जो होती है वो टाइड एड होती है टाइड एड इस तरह होती है कि उसमें कुछ रिस्ट्रिक्शंस होती है कि कहाँ पे आप उसको खर्च कर सकते हैं किस तरीके से खर्च कर सकते हैं और कैसे खर्च करेंगे सो अलॉट ऑफ दैट इज टाइड एड थर्ड ऑन एवरेज ओवर द लास्ट डेकेड देर आर ऑन एवरेज औसतन हर साल हम तकरीबन बारह प्रोजेक्ट्स जो हैं हर फिजिकल ईयर में वो चलाते हैं वी रन अलॉट ऑफ प्रोजेक्ट्स and this is just on average mai aapko ek ausat 1265 projects since agar aap last decade ka ek average nikale ki kitne projects pure pakistan mein not in a specific region pure pakistan mein jitne projects chal rahe hote hain foreign finance aid pe pakistan's psdp projects both at the federal and provincial levels are heavily dependent upon foreign financing 
uh, over the last decade, foreign financing component averages around 30% in federal PSDP projects, but that component rarely materializes in time, uh, leading to project delays, especially mega projects. They also reflect a high dependency at federal and provincial level on foreign financing. Now, interestingly, there is a paper uh, uh, on PIDE website. It was written by Dr. Khalid Mahmood, our uh, uh, colleague, and Dr. Sati. Uh, jo is that PSDP ke public sector development program ke projects hai, unme kitna heavy a component hota hai foreign aid ka, uh, or foreign aid, or they don't always materialize. Agar wo paise kam aate hain, uski wajah projects delay bhi ho jate hain. But on the other hand, it's also a reflection of the fact that our calculation, our kitni ek dependency hai foreign aid inflows pe, sirf apne development priorities ke liye. Over the time, donors have managed to create a very powerful niche and presence for themselves in policy making. Um, Dr. Nadeem has already uh, talked about. There has never been a proper cost. This is very important. This is very important especially for the students who are pursuing their careers uh, or who would likely pursue it further. There has never been a proper cost-benefit analysis in terms of how many projects are mega projects so chote projects so small level ke projects hain unka outcome kya there has never been a proper cost benefit analysis of that despite all the inflows and projects human development indicators remain abysmal uh, barely improving over the decades aap human development indicators utha ke dekhne aisa nahi hai and there has been a lot of inflow of aid in sectors like education health and things like that but if you uh, pursue uh, the numbers over the time, the human development indicators, they, pray, they paint a very uh, abysmal picture. Pakistan ke human development indicators or human development standing hai, wo kabhi bhi achhi nahi rahi. And there it is barely budged over the decades. So despite all the inflows, despite all the projects, it's a proxy, it's a reflection, it's a proxy of development. Pakistan ke development, what it tells you is that all that aid, all those projects have done little to improve Pakistan and Pakistan's human development indicators. Achha, ab usme ye hai ke dekhen, ek worrying aspects jo kuch aate hain, usme ek bada worrying aspect ye hai, ke jo net resource transfer hai, net resource transfer ko aap define karte hain, ke jitni aid a rahi hai, aur phir jitne bahar ja rahe hain, hum repayments kar rahe hain us pe. Net resource transfer has turned negative. Ikkisui sadi mein, since 2000, aur abhi tak aap jitne statistics utha ke dekhen, adad o shumar utha ke dekhen, आपको यह पता चलेगा कि जितने पैसे पाकिस्तान में आए हैं फॉरेन से और जितने हमने रीपेमेंट्स किए हैं डॉलर में उसमें 50 बिलियन डॉलर का फर्क आता है सो इट्स अ नेट रिसोर्स ट्रांसफर फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान टू आउटसाइड अगर आप सारे पैसे जो आए हैं और जितने हमने दिए हैं मैं सिर्फ लास्ट टू डेकेड्स की बात कर रहा हूं लास्ट 23 इयर्स 22 इयर्स की उसमें हमें नुकसान हुआ है 50 बिलियन डॉलर इट्स अ नेट रिसोर्स ट्रांसफर एंड Obviously, when the study comes out, we have used some criteria that we have used to gauge for foreign aid effectiveness. Ki, net resource transfer is one of the important criteria. Right? And uh, last one is, uh, and again, this is very important. If you look at the same time frame, just the last 22, 20, 22 years, uh, most of that support that has come, almost half of that has been balance of payment support. It has nothing to do with projects for development or anything. It is just balance of payment support. So uh, these were some of the findings uh, that I shared with you. Uh, and obviously, I would love you all to pursue whenever that uh, study, whenever the, our study comes online and we publish it. And it will, and it will be, it won't be much time before we do that. But uh, now let me turn to the panelists with uh, some of the questions that I have before I invite you all to have your question. Uh, the first one uh, is to all the panelists, if Asad Hayauddin Saab could start with it. And the question is, in your view, what is the overall effect of foreign aid on economic development in Pakistan? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pied, for inviting us to this event. Uh, last time we gathered, the issue was whether we are addicted to aid or dependent on aid. Today, it's whether it's a boon or a bane. Uh, it depends on how you look at it. One of my favorite quotes that I like to mention is from Alice in Wonderland. 
ندیم الحق صاحب نے پوچھا کس نے کتابیں پڑھی ہیں یہ ایک پرانی کتاب ہے ایلسن وانڈر لینڈ میرے خیال سے یہ ہر ایک کو پڑھنی چاہیے اور اس کا ترجمہ بھی ہونا چاہیے تمام مقامی زبانوں میں پاکستان میں ہر ایک کو سمجھ آئے تو ایلسن وانڈر لینڈ میں ایک سین ہے جس میں ایلس جو وہاں پہنچ جاتی ہے وانڈر لینڈ میں وہاں ایک بلی سے اس کا بلی سے ملاقات ہوتی ہے چشر کیٹ سے تو چشر کیٹ سے ایلس پوچھتی ہے وچ روڈ شوڈ آئی ٹیک سڑکیں ہوتی ہیں تو چشر کیٹ ایلس سے پوچھتی ہے کہ وے یو گوئنگ تو ایلس کہتی ہے آئی ڈونٹ نو تو چشر کیٹ کہتی ہے ڈزنٹ میٹر وچ روڈ یو ٹیک تو ہمارا بھی المیہ ایسا ہی ہے انفارچونیٹلی جو شروع میں ندیم صاحب بتا رہے تھے کہ اگر آپ کو خود نہیں پتا تو پھر آپ کو بتایا جاتا ہے کہ آپ کیا کریں اور پھر آپ کو اس کے لیے اگر ریسورسز نہیں ہیں تو آپ کو ریسورسز لینے پڑتے ہیں پھر آپ کو کنسلٹنٹس ہائر کرنے پڑتے ہیں پھر آپ کو ایکسپرٹس ہائر کرنے پڑتے ہیں اور وہ ایک پورا ایک سلسلہ چلتا ہے سو وے آر وی گوئنگ آئی ڈونٹ تھنک وی کلیئر لاسٹ ٹائم میں نے کہا تھا کہ پانچ سڑکی پہ کھڑی ہو دس سڑکی پہ کھڑے ہو اگر آپ کو پتہ نہیں آپ نے کدھر جانا ہے تو پھر آپ کو کوئی اس ڈائریکشن میں لے جائے گا ان سم بڑی آلسو ٹیک یو ان دیٹ ڈائریکشن بیکاز یو ڈونٹ ہیو این ایجنڈا سیکنڈلی جو میں نے دیکھا ہے کہ اسٹریٹجی ہماری کیا ہے اسٹریٹجی بیسکلی ہے ایکسٹرنل ریسورس موبلائزیشن اینڈ کیکنگ دا کین ڈاؤن دا روڈ اس کو آپ جس طرح ٹرانسلیٹ کرتے ہیں کریں بٹ میں نے فیصلہ نہیں کرنا اگلا آ کے کرے گا اور اس لیے ہم ستائیس یا اٹھائیس دفعہ آئی ایم ایف کے پاس گئے ہیں ڈاکٹر کے پاس انڈیا بھی گیا ہے بنگلہ دیش بھی جاتا ہے باقی بھی جاتے ہیں یہ نہیں کہ نہیں جاتے بٹ ڈاکٹر کے پاس جتنا کم جائیں گے اتنا بہتر ہوتا ہے اور جب ڈاکٹر کے پاس آپ جاتے ہیں تو پھر ڈاکٹر کی پرسکرپشن آپ کو فالو کرنی پڑتی ہے ورنہ آپ کی بیماری دور نہیں ہوتی ہم کیا کرتے ہیں دو اینٹی بائیوٹک گولیاں کھا کے چودہ دن کا کورس چھوڑ دیتے ہیں کہ نہیں وہ خود ٹھیک ہو جائے گا یا حکیم کے پاس چلے جاتے ہیں سو دیٹس پری مچ ان اے نٹ شیل بٹ اوور آل نائنٹین سکسٹی سے آج تک جو ہم نے حساب لگایا تھا ای ڈی میں آف کورس آپ کی ریسرچ پڑھ کے آل بینیفٹ ٹو ہنڈریڈ بلین بٹ بٹ سیونٹی فائیو بلین یو ایس ڈالرس نائنٹین سکسٹی سے آج تک ہمیں ملیں اس میں زیادہ تر پبلک اینڈ فائنینشیل پالیسیز کی طرف سوشل اکنامک ڈیولپمنٹ انفراسٹرکچر اور واٹر اینڈ انرجی کی طرف یہ گئے ہیں تو اس کا ٹرکل ڈاؤن افیکٹ ہو سکتا ہے بٹ کبھی اس کی افیکٹیونیس نہیں اسٹڈی کی گئی ویدر دس انویسٹمنٹ ایڈ آخر انویسٹمنٹ ہی ہوتی ہے ہم نے ایک بیک دی آنول آف انویسٹمنٹ کی تھی اس کے بعد ہم نے پائٹ کے ساتھ ایم او یو بھی سائن کیا تھا ان ای ڈی کہ اس کو اسٹرکچر دیا جائے تو اٹ واز ایٹین پرسینٹ بیسکلی اگر اف دیز اے رف ریٹرن آن فارن انویسٹمنٹ آپ دیکھیں تو یہ سیونٹی فائیو بلین کو نائنٹین سکسٹی سے ٹوئنٹی ٹوئنٹی تھری تک ہم نے دیکھا اٹ واز اباؤٹ ایٹین پرسینٹ ویدر دیٹس گڈ اور بیڈ آئی لیو اٹ ٹو دی آڈینس کہ ٹوئنٹی پرسینٹ ہونا چاہیے ریٹرن یا ٹوئنٹی فائیو ہونا چاہیے سو یس آن سم دیز پروجیکٹس دیر واز اے بینیفٹ وڈ وی ڈو وی بیسکلی یوز سکسٹی ٹو پرسینٹ آف دس ایڈ فار بجٹری سپورٹ دیٹ مینس پاکستان کی عوام کو اس کا کوئی ڈائریکٹ فائدہ نہیں ہوتا کوئی فورٹین پرسینٹ ہم کموڈیٹی سپورٹ میں استعمال کرتے ہیں جو سعودی عرب سے تیل وغیرہ خریدنا ہوتا ہے وہ تھوڑا سا آپ کو افیکٹ کرتا ہے پھر ایٹ پرسینٹ از پروگرام فائنینسنگ اینڈ سکسٹین پرسینٹ از پروجیکٹ فائنینسنگ پروجیکٹ فائنینسنگ آپ کے پروجیکٹس ہوتے ہیں مختلف انفراسٹرکچر وغیرہ کے جس میں ماضی میں تربیلا ڈیم بھی بنا اس میں ٹیکنیکل اسسٹنس بھی آپ کو دی جاتی ہے جو لوگ ٹیکنیکل اسسٹنس سے مفید ہو جاتے ہیں بٹ اوور آل ہم نے دیکھا کہ نائنٹین فورٹی سیون ٹو ڈیٹ اباؤٹ ہنڈریڈ اینڈ سکسٹی بلین ڈالرز ہم نے لونز میں لیے اور اباؤٹ ٹوینٹی بلین ڈالرز ہمیں ایڈ اور گرانٹس میں ملا اور انٹرسٹنگلی جب ہم نے دیکھا کہ نائنٹین ففٹی ون سے ٹو تھاؤزینڈ الیون تک یو ایس پاکستان سکسٹی سیون بلین ڈالرز اس میں ملٹری بھی ہے سب کچھ ہے اور موسٹلی جو ریسنٹ پیریڈ تھا 2002 سے 2010 تک اس میں یو ایس پاکستان میں آلموسٹ نائنٹین بلین انیس بلین ڈالرز آئے تھے سو اف یو لوک ایٹ اٹ یس اٹس اے شارٹ کٹ کہ آپ خود اپنی بیلٹ ٹائٹننگ نہیں کرتے آپ کو باہر سے ریسورسز مل رہے ہیں اٹس ایزی منی چیپ منی آئی ڈونٹ نو بٹ ون فائنینس منسٹر یوز ٹو سے کہ مجھے جلدی سے پیسے لا کے دو باہر سے تو ہم جب پوچھتے رہے کہ سستے پیسے یا مہنگے پیسے تو ان کو اس کی ضرورت نہیں تھی بیکاز اگر آپ دیکھیں ہمارا ڈیٹ کیوں بڑھا اکیس فیصد ہمارا ڈیٹ جو ہے وہ کمرشل بینک سے ہیں جو آپ کا لحاظ نہیں کرتے فورٹی ون پرسینٹ آپ کا بائی لیٹرل پارٹنرس سے ہے اور فورٹی ایٹ پرسینٹ ملٹی لیٹرل 
ورلڈ بینک وغیرہ ایشین ڈیولپمنٹ بینک سے ہے سو ہم کیوں یہ ایڈ لے رہے ہیں ہم کیوں یہ اسسٹنس لے رہے ہیں کیونکہ ہمارے یہاں تین یا چار گیپس ہیں پہلے سیونگز گیپ اور فورن ایکسچینج گیپ ہوتا تھا یا ریزرو گیپ ہوتا تھا کہ آپ کے پاس سیونگز نہیں ہیں یا ڈومیسٹک ریسورسز نہیں ہیں یا آپ کے پاس فورن ایکسچینج نہیں ہیں تو اس گیپ کو پورا کرنے کے لیے آپ باہر سے لیتے ہیں اور جو سب سے امپورٹنٹ گیپ ہے جو اکانومس صاحبان یہاں بیٹھے ہیں وہ ہمارا فزیکل کنسٹرینٹ یا بجٹ ڈیفیسٹ گیپ ہے اور یہ ہمارا ایکسپینڈیچر اور ریونیو پہ بیسڈ ہے اور سب سے بڑا پرابلم یہ ہے کہ ہمارا ایکسپینڈیچر آلموسٹ سیونٹی فائیو بلین ڈالرز ہے سالانہ اور ہمارا ریونیو فورٹی فائیو بلین ڈالرز ہے تو تیس بلین ڈالر کا گیپ جو ہمارا اپنا ہے اس کو ہم باہر سے بڑھتے ہیں اور کیونکہ ہمارا ٹریڈ بیلنس ڈاکٹر منظور بیٹھے ہوئے یہاں پہ انہوں نے اس پہ کام کیا ہوا ہے ٹریڈ بیلنس ہمارا آؤٹ آف سنک ہے ہم زیادہ امپورٹ کرتے ہیں کم ایکسپورٹ کرتے ہیں وہ ہمارے کرنٹ اکاؤنٹ پہ زور ڈالتا ہے ہماری بیلنس آف پیمنٹس افیکٹ ہوتی ہیں اور یہ وشس سرکل جو ہے یہ اسی طرح گھومتا رہتا ہے لیو دا ریسٹ کیوں نہیں تھینک یو نیکسٹ بائیس تھینک یو Well, thank you very much. Look, um, uh, I think there's a lot of actually agreement uh, between what the panelists are saying here and, and also what uh, Nadine kicked us off with. I think, the, uh, I think we can get into this question of does aid bring benefits? Does it bring costs? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Aid is. Aid is. Countries do not provide aid purely out of the desire to address poverty. Countries provide aid for all kinds of reasons, including... geopolitical concerns, the domestic political drivers, aid is part of the global economy and it's going to remain it. I think the question for Pakistan and the questions for all countries receiving aid is what do you do with that aid? What do you do with it? How are you going to use it? I think what the international literature says is, is quite clear on this. Uh, you've got lots of studies showing negative impacts of aid. You've got lots of studies showing positive impacts of aid. But the, the consensus in the international literature, insofar as there is one, is that aid has a positive impact when the recipient country has a plan, when the recipient country has a program and can mobilize aid behind that program. So let me just elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, I think it's clear that international aid, especially when provided on, on highly concessional terms, can bring benefits to any country. It, you're, you're essentially getting a resource transfer. That resource transfer can be used to finance infrastructure investment. It can be used to finance humanitarian relief. It can be used to finance the balance of payments following a macroeconomic shock. It can be used to get access to Uh, international skills, international capacity, international experiences, all of these things are undoubtedly uh, an opportunity if that opportunity can be realized. All of those things can provide benefits if they are taken advantage of. On the other hand, the literature is also very clear that aid can do harm, aid can do damage. If, if large flows of aid come into an unproductive economy, you get Uh, currency appreciation, you get Dutch disease effects, you get aid basically squeezing out exports as, as economic activity moves to take advantage of, of aid-created opportunities in the non-tradable sector, and that squeezes out your exports. So, so there's macroeconomic effects of aid that can be very negative. There's also political economy effects of aid that can be very negative. If, if aid is coming in and it is propping up a government that is not interested in the development of its people, if it's not interested in long-term development, then, then aid creates moral hazard. It is prolonging and protecting uh, a, a government or a regime that is not interested in long-term development. And there's certainly examples of that happening internationally. Um, and then there's lots of issues about fragmentation. There's lots of issues about how projects are designed and delivered and how that can be supply driven and it can push countries away from their domestically owned development trajectory. No doubt about that. And there's a whole literature about doing development differently, about uh, good governance, about turning good governance on its head, about uh, the importance of domestic ownership for driving aid. Most development practitioners are very familiar with that literature. We may not always 
implement that in practice, but, but the aid industry is very reflective in terms of these negative impacts that can come from fragmented aid, from driving an external agenda. I think we are aware of this. Ultimately, I think in Pakistan, the problem is that we are lacking a government that enforces the discipline that is needed on donors. I think donors should do better. And I am, not, I am not abdicating our responsibility for this. We should be always listening. We should be always aware of the risks. We should be coordinating amongst ourselves. We should be trying to put plans in place. We should be trying to put programs in place that represent the, the wishes of the poor people in the countries that we are serving. And I, I think I would like to think that we as an institution are always welcoming of that conversation. And, and I hope to hear more about how we can do that over the coming days. The World Bank at the moment is an, in, involved in a, in a program, a nationwide program, where we're going out and we're hearing from universities, from think tanks, from communities about what the bottom up development needs of the country are, precisely because we want to hear what the country needs, not just what the politicians tell us. So that's important for us. That is very important for us. And we want to hear from you how we can do better. But I fundamentally believe that at the end of the day, the problems in Pakistan are about governance and institutions and elite capture. And the international experience has been very clear that aid works best when government determines its own development vision. And then it comes to the donors and it says, you help us. We want you to do this. We're not gonna let you push us around. We're not gonna let you tell us what to do. We know what we want to do. You tell us how you're gonna help us, and if you can't help us, we don't want you. Pakistan needs to be in the position of strength where it can say that to its donors, where it can tell its donors, we want your help, but we don't want you if you're not gonna get behind our de development vision. For that to happen, we need a political elite, we need uh, economic elite, we need academics, we need civil society who can articulate and agree on that vision and enforce the development partners to get behind it. And if, if that happens, if that ask is there, then, then I for one will be pushing my institution as, as hard as I can, and I think I can speak for my country director on this too, the World Bank would be entirely behind that development vision. I think what we need is the articulation of that vision for us to unify behind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Best. Uh, if we can... <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, if we can quickly have a word from the next panelist before uh, I have a few questions, and then we'll move to the uh, uh, two other questions. Please. Gee, thank you very much. Uh, before uh, I give any kind of arguments, I think there are already enough arguments here, uh, which can tell you whether aid is effective or not. So after Dr. Nadeem's op opening salvo, I was feeling as if a goat is going to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> so let's see who survives. Uh, and I want to give a speech to Dr. Nadeem, but I don't want to listen to Dr. Nadeem, but I don't want to listen to Dr. Nadeem seriously. He said that economists do not have a future. Uh, I'm sitting in front of you. I am son of the soil. I was born in this city. I went to a public school here, Sarkari school, mein, uh, Aligarh model school here. After that, I went to a comprehensive school. I went to a normal Sarkari school. Then I went to a government college in Lahore. Mein so I'm a product of public education in this country. I'm sitting in front of you. So you do have a future. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I think I would just echo what Tawaiyas and uh, Asad Hayauddin Saab have said. Uh, aid itself, uh, there could be different connotations. Uh, it, it could be political, it could be apolitical. Istamal is, is more important. And I think we don't have a meta-analysis or it's very, it would be very difficult to have a meta-analysis which could conclusively prove or uh, establish whether aid is effective in of itself or not. Uh, Shahid Saab ne have quoted some historical figure, uh, but I was looking at some numbers. I think Pakistan was uh, one of the largest recipients of ODA, or Official Development Assistance, back in 1960s, when it was as high as, I think, uh, 14 or 15 percent of Pakistan's GNI. It has really, really come down. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, it's less than, I think, 1 percent now. 
और इसी तरह एब्सोलूट नंबर्स में एट का क्वांटम काफ़ी ज़्यादा लगता है बट वेन यू लुक एट दिस इन रिलेटिव टर्म्स एज अ परसेंटेज ऑफ ऑफ बजट इट्स नॉट दैट ह्यूज गवर्नमेंट इज़ द लार्जेस्ट स्पेंडर इन दिस इन दिस कंट्री जिस तरह डॉक्टर महबूब नदीम साहब ने भी कहा देर आर देर आर प्रोज एंड कॉन्स ऑफ दैट मोस्टली कॉन्स गवर्नमेंट इज़ नॉट अफिशेंट स्पेंडर ऑफ द मनी Uh, all the donors money put together is still i think less than 10% of uh, of our budget which is not huge aur bahut sari jo development assistance ka paisa jata hai wo un projects mein jata hai jo government khud decide karti hai uh, when the annual development plans are being uh, developed when line departments think about how budgets are going to be presented to isliye sirf donor ko blame karna ya donor bashing is i think just one part of the story although i agree that we do become a part of the problem but a lot of the problem is driven by lack of capacity on government side uh, as tobias was mentioning there were hardly you if you go to ministries and line departments of any government whether it's federal or provincial you would hardly come across their sector plan so what is the plan where do they want to go in 3 to 5 years time even if even if they do they're not properly costed they're not properly thought through Uh, एक वेग सा आइडिया होता है कि जी पाँच साल में हमने uh, तालीम फैलानी है सो इट्स अ वेरी जनरल एंड जेनेरिक टर्म वट डज इट मीन इन इन एक्चुअल डिलीवरी टर्म्स हाउ मच रिसोर्स डू यू नीड वट इज़ योर प्लान टू गेट देयर और जब वो कभी प्लान बन भी जाते हैं तो दी दी देर आर ह्यूज इशूज ऑन इम्प्लीमेंटेशन विच आई थिंक विल कम टू लेटर इन द डिस्कशन गवर्नमेंट्स कैपेसिटी टू इम्प्लीमेंट प्लान वैदर इट्स ओन प्लान और कोट एंड कोट Uh, dictated by others is 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 quite poor so that's why you see uh, a huge portion of development budget remains unspent each year and this is a systemic problem which is common across all layers of government so uh, i think just to conclude because i think we we don't have much time mai uski misal aapko is tarah ki is tarah se dunga ki aapka ek gareeb sa rishtedar hai ya chale bahut gareeb bhi nahi hai sust aur kahil hai और हर छः महीने के बाद वो आपके पास आ जाता है और कहता है कि मुझे आप हज़ार रुपये और दे दें दो हज़ार रुपये और दे दें मैंने इससे ये करना है मैंने इससे वो करना है लेकिन दस साल गुजर जाते हैं पंद्रह साल गुजर जाते हैं बीस साल गुजर जाते हैं द पोअर रिलेटिव इज़ नॉट स्टैंडिंग ऑन देर ओन टू फीट तो आप कुछ अर्से के बाद क्या करेंगे या तो आप पैसे देना बंद कर देंगे या आप उससे कहेंगे कि जी मुझे कोई प्लान बताओ कि आपने मेरे पैसे वापस कैसे करने हैं तो अनफॉर्चुनेटली पाकिस्तान इज़ लाइक दैट निकम्मा रिलेटिव ऑफ योर्स जिसके पास को बहुत ज़्यादा हम हमारी थिंकिंग की कैपेसिटी uh, इतनी नहीं है ऑफ कोर्स एक जनरल से टर्म मैं यूज़ कर रहा हूँ बट देर हैज़ बिन लॉट ऑफ मेंशन ऑफ पॉवर्टी इन दिस कंट्री आई थिंक द पॉवर्टी दैट वी सफर फ्रॉम इज पॉवर्टी ऑफ थॉट एंड दैट इज द इंडिजिनस पॉवर्टी ऑफ थॉट सो आल कंक्लूड हेयर uh thank you very much ji uh now just a few quick uh, questions before i uh, to turn to the floor uh for their questions uh my first question is to asad saab asad saab uh, you uh, mentioned some of the statistics and being secretary ead of course you would know a lot about this thing so can you please uh, at least shed light on the fact that a lot of the uh, agreements that we sign they are not public public has no access to it we have no idea i tried to uh, i tried many times i went to the ead i talked to people despite an mou they won't even give us let alone uh, uh, see the agreements they won't give, even give us uh, data and you see this uh, uh, this uh, uh, thing this issue with uh, the not being uh, uh, documents not being accessible to the public like a lot of cpec agreements i have never seen any cpec agreement being public has any one of you seen any agreement like that in public so why this secrecy uh if you can give me a example i mean i at least the loan documents that we signed as a secti ead signs on behalf of the president of pakistan it's in the media i mean the pid is there the associated press is there radio pakistan is there the minister in charge always he or she would like to be pictured standing behind the secti as a witness that's why the minister doesn't sign the secti signs on behalf of the president so i can only answer for my period before me and after me i don't know but anybody who would come we would have regular media briefings and now if you want the actual physical copy of the document with the signature of the secti and the ambassador or the head of jaica or whoever else is there i would have to check ke article 19a freedom of information ke tahat uski kya status hai but international agreements 
I don't think are state secrets unless it's a military or some other type of an agreement. So I would say that Freedom of Information Act, they should give you that data. Uh, another way that I used to do it is go on the website of the ministry and all of these loan agreements, because unfortunately, uh, with the last 10, 15 years, the EAD's performance evaluation is that you have loan liye hain, unfortunately. Uh, for example, we took one loan from Korea. It was a billion dollar loan, 35 year repayment, 2.5%. That's free money as far as I'm concerned. Yes, you could say that it's not free money, but if you look at the value, so a billion dollars over 25, 30 years at 2% is free. Uh, I can help you after this and find out, but I don't think they're state secrets, but I've been out of touch, so I don't know. IMF negotiations are a separate category. EAD did not deal with that. As I said, EAD meant everything but IMF. IMF is Q block finance. G agreed. Lekin dekhin, maine aapko CPEC ki example I give you an example of CPEC, and there are a lot of having a having a statement in the media is something else, but having access to the document which has details about the plans and how the plans came about. It's something else, and it still remains a secret. But anyway, I'll uh, ha uh, head over to the second and third panelists now. And this is a question to both of you, to Tobias and to Naveed, uh, because this is something interesting that you mentioned. So I have a quick question on this thing. Okay, uh, government department, it's ve very well known. Even back in the 60s, 50s, I was reading the literature, and uh, it's not that foreign governments, uh, foreign governments give aid as a charity and they don't question it. it, it there has been a lot of debate on there, in those capitals on why they should be giving foreign aid. And one of the interesting uh, uh, facts from there is that they already knew that in uh, developing countries, the institutions, especially the public institutions, they don't have the capacity to spend all the money. But yet we see institutions, aid institutions, uh, donors giving money to the same institutions again and again when there has been uh, this fact, there is, it has been, I mean, there has been this fact in right in front of us that they can't spend it efficiently and for the purpose that it was made for. I'll just give you the example of FBR. In the early 2000s, they, uh, one of the donor agencies gave them a $400 million loan and it all went to waste. Now the same donor agency has given another $400 million loan again to the FBR. It signed an agreement in 2019 up till now, they haven't used a single penny of it, but the same donor agencies and FBR have reached an agreement to renegotiate it at least two or three times. So what would you say about this? Would you, would this, uh, as Naveed, Naveed was saying, it's not just about donors being donor bashing. It's not donor bashing, but can we say donors have no idea what the capacity of the government institutions is and they keep giving loans to them, please? So look, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a good question. And I think that there is undoubtedly uh, pressures on donors to, to reach disbursement targets and there's pressures on us to, to spend money. So that's part of, the, that's part of the, the, the picture. But we say, oh, well, that, that spending had no positive impact whatsoever. How do you know that? What, what is that based on? Like, what is the actual measurement you're using to say that our support to FBR over the past 10 years, 12 years, has had no positive impact whatsoever. Now, I think that what we've seen in FBR is that some things have worked, some things haven't worked. I think we have made some significant process, progress with some of the systems. I think some of the reforms to GST harmonization over the past year have, have the potential for actually really supporting revenue growth. I think we've seen some reforms to uh, land valuation tables that were driven by uh, World Bank technical assistance and technical assistance from other development partners. All of that is very positive. What we haven't seen is the tax to GDP ratio increase. Well, that's true. That's true. The outcome is not being achieved. But that is because we still see massive exemptions in the tax system. We still see uh, this complete failure to tax new sources of, of, of revenue. Uh, we see actually exemptions increasing over time. So I think what I'm saying here, right, is we've got to be careful. It, it's my original point again. We've got to be careful in saying that either, oh, it never works and it's a complete disaster, or it's going to fix all of the country's problems. It's neither of those things. 
development assistance and can can help support systems it can help drive pro progress it can help institutions achieve their objectives but that overall environment has to be there where there is leadership, where there is progress being achieved, where people want to see progress being achieved. If the overall policy environment is negative, aid is not gonna fix your problem, right? At the, at the most, we can make incremental improvements to some systems and some processes. Thank you, Navita. Gee, so I'll make a bold statement here. So I think it's, it's unfair to expect development partners to be revolutionaries. We are not revolutionaries. Uh, we are minions, we are civil servants. We have our own incentives. Uh, but, but having said that, uh, and again, aid is not a solution to all of Pakistan's problems. Uh, as I said, it's a tiny portion of our budget, and I think in the overall development uh, journey of Pakistan, its, it's role is it's, it's not huge. Uh, so I, th I think it should be given a, its due share, not, uh, not sh should not be given disproportionate share of the blame. Uh, but, but I'm not saying uh, that development partners are not to be blamed. Uh, but when you say that uh, donors go to government ag again and again, uh, knowing fully well that its capacity to spend is perhaps uh, not great, uh, I think the capacity is not optimum, it's suboptimum. But what, what is the alternative? So who do we go to? Uh, so when donors come to a country like Pakistan and they negotiate with government of Pakistan, any kind of uh, you know, development assistance package, it's the government that we have to work with, right? These are the institutions such as Economic Affairs Division and Planning and Development Departments in the provinces who, whose job is to tell us where that money and where that assistance is required. Right? Donors do not come with blueprints anymore. Uh, uh, you know, so I've not, in my 15 years of experience of working in this sector, I've not come across any uh, incident where at least the uh, organization that I'm representing here would have gone to any government and said that this is what you need to do. To do. Uh, we always ask for what are government's own plans, you know, what are, what are their planning processes like, uh, where do they want to get to using our as well as their own money. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of effort uh, gone into uh, what is called capacity building. Uh, this is a term that uh, people like Dr. Nadeem certainly do not like. Uh, but the, the, uh, if you look at in individual uh, uh, instances or individual examples, there are uh, benefits that Pakistan have gained out of this capacity de development assistance that it has been receiving. If you look at uh, health and education budgets of Punjab, for instance, they have certainly grown quite significantly over the last five to 10 years. And uh, so has government's capacity to spend. As I mentioned earlier, it's not optimum yet. We are not there yet, but it's, it's not all gloom and doom. Uh, it's very easy to make, of course, sweeping statements and overgeneralize things. But you have to dig really deep and look at these things uh, uh, at times with, with a micro lens. Uh, and I think some, somebody mentioned evaluations. Uh, if you go to websites of, uh, I believe, all development partners in Pakistan, World Bank, DFID, or FCDO, as it is called now, you would find documents which are evaluations and reviews of our programs. And sometimes they are joint uh, evaluations with government. It's a pity that government does not do evaluation of its own projects. It should, uh, and a lot of our policy dialogue is along those lines. But at least so far as we are concerned, you can go to our website and see how that money is spent. Uh, you mentioned cost and benefit analysis. I think there's hardly any program that we start without doing a cost and benefit analysis, and I think so does the World Bank. And there are impact evaluations, there are midterm evaluations. So these are some of the uh, guiding documents for us. These tell us where the course correction is required, where are we going right, where are we going wrong. Uh, but nothing is perfect in this uh, world, of course, and uh, so is the aid architecture. Uh, thank you, Namit Saab. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, a lot of, uh, there are donors on whose websites you can find those evaluations, but then there are a lot of donors uh, about uh, whom we do not know what the financing outcomes were. And now we go to the floor to the questions. I uh, request you all to be brief in your questions. Uh, but just before we go to the floor, since uh, Navita mentioned capacity building, it's a very uh, buzzword being bandied about. So let me just share a, uh, a very short, a brief uh, incident. When I was working in the finance division, we had one officer of the finance division go to Harvard. No other place, mind you, Harvard. Harvard is one of the top institutes in the world for a capacity building course. The only issue was that he was set to retire in three months and he went on a six month course. So that's capacity building in Pakistan. 
mostly. So there are many instances like this. But please, uh, I'll hand it over uh, to the floor. Any questions, please? Uh, G, please. Thank you very much. I'm Talatanwar, Professor, School of Economics, BZU. So, you know, many countries have, you know, built their economies on aid. And aid has been effective in many countries like, you know, South Korea and in other South Asian, other East Asian countries. But aid has not been effective in Pakistan because we do not have any plan to spend. Most of our aid is spent on donor's agenda. And aid is spent on, uh, you know, the area which do not produce or which do not build the capacity to earn foreign exchange. So our aid is, uh, you know, we spend aid, we, uh, we spend, you know, f uh, foreign resources on uh, projects like, you know, road, infrastructure. You know, we do not have, you know, uh, sensible agreement, you know. We have a very expensive agreement of IPPs and the cost of uh, which has been paid now uh, by the people of Pakistan in terms of higher electricity bill. So this is the problem, I think, with our uh, policy makers and those who are sitting in the Ministry of Finance. They don't care about, you know, about the policies and its impact. They only seek the aid, you know. People who are sitting in the, uh, you know, Ministry of Finance or Planning Commission, you know, they decide the agenda of the development in, or the investment program of government based on the priority committee. There is a priority committee in the in Ministry of Finance, and that determines the development spend, you know, development spending. But they have inflows and outflows. Whatever inflows are coming from the donor, they allow it, you know, irrespective of examining the effectiveness of the aid. So that is a problem with us, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Please, I'd just ask you all to be uh, brief. Please, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, uh, the secretary and the president for the wonderful conference. But uh, the question, my question is related to Tobias, the World Bank representative. Well, you have well explained that the problem of Pakistan is not that we are getting debt or not. The problem is that what we do with debt. This is very important. And the institutions are responsible for not doing good. It is right. But my problem is that if have you ever seen a bird whose claws are tight? And then you say to the bird, move on. I am referring towards the tied loans. Do you think that there is some suggestion for the donor agencies that they should not give us the tied loans so that you should be free to spend our loans, whatever we want. Uh, Tobias, would you like to answer? Yeah, look, can I, maybe I can react to both of those points in, 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 at, at once. Um, there's a great book called How Asia Works. And it, it talks about how the East Asian economies achieved very rapid rates of growth. And, and a key point of that book, to me at least, was that these economies were often doing things that their development partners disagreed with. They were taking unorthodox approaches to economic development. But they had a very clear and coherent plan. And what they used the international donors to do was to provide support uh, where, where they could in very selected areas and to share knowledge and ideas. And then those governments in those countries would take or leave those ideas based on, on what was 
aligned with what they wanted to do and how they believed their economies could develop. So it wasn't just it wasn't just taking everything that was given, it was being very selective in what was taken. And aid was never a big part of the uh, growth story in those economies. It was always at the margin. So, so I, I think that that point that um, development as a process, a, aid can help, but it can't underpin is critical, right? And I've made that point already. But when it comes to this argument that aid is somehow tying the hands of government and, and preventing government from, from undertaking its own development path, my, my challenge would be to, to, to the government of, of Pakistan or to whoever I'm talking, to Pakistan in general, put together a development plan that is credible, that, that, that you can implement and that you've taken credible steps to begin implementing. Take that plan, go to the World Bank, go to the IMF, and they say, we want this plan to be the basis for your next program, for your next IMF program, for your next World Bank budget support program, and see what happens. I don't think the fund or the World Bank is going to say, no, we refuse to help you. What happens at the moment is Pakistan finds itself in a balance of payments crisis, then it goes to the World Bank and it goes to the IMF and it says, tell us what we need to do to get external financing. Just tell us what we need to do so we can get the money, so we can get ourselves out of this emergency, right? So, so the, the boot is always on the foot of the donors because, because Pakistan gets into these crises and then it comes without a plan and it comes from a position of weakness to its international partners. My suggestion would be we're about to very likely come into a, a, a new IMF program under a new government. I would love to see the new government come in with a, a credible, costed, recognized plan that, ad that addresses some of the key structural constraints in this economy. And it says to the IMF, here's our plan. Now we want you to get behind it. There's nothing to stop that from happening. And that, in my experience, is where international aid works best. Thank you, Tobias. And any other questions, please? Yes, please. I am Dr. Kasim Bugyo from Sindh. Pehle to me is cheez pe ahtijaj karunga ke hum har baat par murde ilzam apne paak vatan ko thehrate hain. Lekin hum अपने किरदार को नहीं देखते कि हमने अपने मुल्क को क्या दिया है और यह कभी इवैल्यूएट नहीं करते हैं कि मुल्क ने हमें क्या दिया है मुझे अफसोस से कहना पड़ता है कि इन तमाम चीजों के तबाही और बर्बादी का वाहिद سبب मुल्क के अंदर पाई जाने वाली करप्शन है क्यों कर इस पर जो है वो नहीं बोला जाता बस किस्मती है हमारी कि हम सर प्लीज 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 जी जी प्लीज जी बिल्कुल सर डॉक्टर साहब मैं सिर्फ आपको सलाम देना चाह रहा था 10 साल पहले भी जो आपसे मुलाकात हुई थी जब हम बीएसपी में थे आप भी आप भी, भी आप नहीं बदले वही चीज है हर रोज ही करप्शन की खबरें अखबारों में होती है that's why एक बार बट लेकिन आपका सवाल अगर आ जाए बहुत शुक्रिया मैं मैं सवाल पर भी आ रहा हूं मैं सवाल पर भी आ रहा हूं देखिए किस चीज की इस मुल्क के कमी के अंदर कमी है कि हम दूसरों से भीख मांगते हैं आईएमएफ से लेते हैं वर्ल्ड बैंक से लेते हैं बदकिस्मती यह है कि हमने बेईमानी में भी बेईमानी करके दिखाई है उसमें भी ईमानदारी नहीं दिखाई है ये इतने اعداد و شمار سن کے جو ہے وہ سب کے ہوش اڑ چکے ہوں گے کہ ہم روپیہ دیتے لیتے ہیں 10 روپے اس پر ادا کرتے ہیں یہ 9 روپے کہاں جاتے ہیں کن کی جیبوں میں جاتے ہیں کون اس پر عیاشی کر رہا ہے ہمارے خون پسینے کی دی ہوئی ٹیکس کو کون عیاشیوں میں اڑا رہا ہے کبھی اس پر بولا گیا कोई जरूरत नहीं है आईएमएफ के पास कश्ता किस्ता लेके जाने की 
कोई जरूरत नहीं है हमें जो है वो कुदरत ने हमें इतने मसाइल से माला माल करके रखा है ये जो मिमलकत पाकिस्तान है नहमत खुदाबंदी से कम नहीं है सर फाइन सर वी हैव योर पॉइंट बिल्कुल सर सवाल अगर आपका बता दे वैसे एक चीज सवाल ये है जी सवाल सर. मेरा ये है जी सर खुदारा खुदारा करप्शन पर बोलिए जिसने हमारी सत्यानाश सर प्लीज योर कैन वी हैव दू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच जी थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर साहब कैन वी हैव द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन एंड प्लीज बी ब्रीफ एंड टू द पॉइंट इन योर क्वेश्चन यू हैव द क्वेश्चन टू द पैनलिस्ट प्लीज जी एनीबडी एल्स असलम दिस इज इफत वफा uh sir my question is uh, from the representative from the uh, world bank and imf actually uh, i do agree with the um, tight aid uh, just following the footprint of our government uh, it should be so but uh, i would uh, like to know in what sense you do tight it uh, 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 won't you uh, uh, why don't you go a step ahead uh that uh, why don't you assist them if you find there is no spending capacity in the organization or some government body or whosoever is asking for that aid uh then why don't uh, you uh, on uh, with your I mean uh, sincerity and honesty you you just consider the uh condition of the economy and suggest them some better uh, it is what i am saying like uh, uh, it is being said that instead of giving a fish just teach them fishing so uh, are you doing something sincerely uh, in this uh, uh, regard as well that you are going to guide these economies or uh, uh, letting them know the other footprints of the other economies and other governments that how do how did they come out of their uh, such uh, uh, bad phases thank, thank you ma'am thank, thank you, you sir Uh, to bias could you like to answer the question okay uh, we have uh, dr shahid kardar online he has a question dr shahid kardar would you like to go ahead please a uh, very quick and a very simple question i, I certainly concede that we never somehow have a credible plan or a program even finance the bop my question is a very simple one why don't the donors simply refuse and walk away if we don't have a credible plan maybe if you will learn to swim so the question is why can't the donors for once literally refuse or are you just in the business of actually bailing out creditors thank you shahid sir um, we can take another question from the floor before the panelists answer that Assalamu alaikum this is Shahbak uh, from Islamia University of Bahawalpur my question is to all three of the speakers sir uh, as the topic of uh, topic of discussion is foreign aid and boon or uh, uh, ban so my question is how can pakistan effectively harness foreign aid to foster sustainable development and reduce future re- uh, reliance on foreign aid without compromising its economic sovereignty thank you uh, so we have three questions uh, uh, you have one was directed at tobias um, uh, tobias if you would like to answer that question about uh, tied and untied it then there was uh, dr shahid kardar's question about why do the donors still keep on giving aid why don't they just refuse it uh, i would like navid and you to answer that question and then the third one is about sustainability so tobias please go ahead look uh, great questions um i think the this why don't we teach to fish instead of giving a fish okay so so i i, I think that's exactly what donors try to do and and this idea of conditionality this idea of tide aid i think that's what we mean by tide aid right conditionality whenever the world bank does uh has conditions has policy conditions those conditions have been agreed with the government we sit down with government we say look what is your where do you want to move to what is it that you can commit to and so it's not it 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 is never us coming out of nowhere and saying you have to do these things it's the product of a conversation where in programs and projects there is some agreement on on the direction we want to move in i think the problem we all face is that that direction often changes 
and, and that the direction in any particular institutional agency is often inconsistent with the broader policy environment or, or, or the policy direction, which is often very changeable, very dynamic. So, so uh, you know, I, I just want to give, be very clear that when we're engaging in a project, typically we come in, we say, look, where does the government want to go with this? We provide some support, we provide technical assistance, we provide advice to that government agency, we provide training, and that's all about teaching to fish. It's all about building the capacity of that institution. Does it work all the time? Absolutely not. It does not work all the time, and, and I wouldn't pretend that it does. But, but that, that philosophy is exactly how it is supposed to work. And, and, and I think that there is at least a genuine attempt most of the time to make that work, however imperfectly. Um, uh, on the second question, why don't donors just walk away if there is no plan? What, what an excellent question. Um, and I'm going to be very honest. I mean, I, I think that the, the answer to that question is that sometimes uh, there is a perceived risk that, that if international partners do not support uh, a country or an economy, uh, the, the costs to the people in that economy or the costs of instability in that country would be a, a problem for people and a problem for the world, right? So, for example, in Pakistan with the floods last year, clearly the international community had an obligation to provide some help and, and they did so even if we had doubts about the broader macroeconomic situation. Do we want to withhold our help when poor people are in need? That's a very tricky thing to ask and it's a very, uh, it's, it's a very difficult trade-off to make. But, but ultimately, I, I think the question is the right one. Um, at what point does international assistance delay or ameliorate the incentives on political leaders to take the choices that need to be made? And, and, and uh, I don't have a clear answer to that question. Thank you. Uh, Navid sir, then we'll go to Asad sir. Ji, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Madam, you have given a counter example in Urdu. I would like to give a counter example. I think that we have to cut ourselves from cutting ourselves and we have to sit in a cage like we have to get out of the world and we have to get out of the world. So perhaps our example has become that. But I think coming to these excellent uh, questions, uh, so I would just like to refer to uh, two uh, success stories, I would say. BISP, we all know all the names. I think this has become a success story all over the world. Many people may not know this, many people may know this, but when it started, there were two development partners who assisted the government of Pakistan in establishing that institution, and that is DFID and the World Bank. And look where BISP has gone. In the whole world, it's a role model of how social development or social protection is delivered to people. So uh, Pakistan can deliver uh, when it wants to and when there is good leadership and there is good plan and there is uh, will to implement that plan. Or the other example, is, it will become very technical, but we, uh, fortunately we have Dr. Manzoor with us. He will probably tell you today or tomorrow in a session. Mein FBR is usually it's synonymous with inefficiency, if not with other bad words that I don't want to use. But within FBR, uh, and if, I know my World Bank colleagues have, have different views on this, there's a recent initiative called Pakistan Single Window. Uh, this is best in the class in the world. Uh, Dr. Manzoor will tell you about how that is improving trade efficiency in Pakistan. So uh, there are success stories, but of course, when we are sitting in conversations like this, when things are discussed in very broad brush generalization, so I, I think Islamic examples go, it's easier for us to ignore. Uh, Dr. Shahid Kardar ka bahut acha sawal tha. Sir, mera jawab uska ye hoga ke, as I said earlier, we are not inclusive, we have also had a lot of rice and rice. But having said that, I think there are international obligations which Pakistan has to follow and the development partners have to follow when it comes to giving development assistance to Pakistan. Thank you. Yes, Asad Saab. I'll try to uh, address most of these issues. Uh, essentially, jo ek cheez, I think we address nahi ki humne, we ke sab kuch ek context ke andar hota hai. Ye ek khala mein nahi hota. Iski jo political economy hai, wo iski context hai. Uh, agar aap dekhen, United States ki taraf se hume kitni aid mili hai, some estimates are 70 billion dollars, okay? Uh, military kitni thi, itni nahi thi. 
those of us who remember ration cards in PL 480, Pakistan was food insecure at one time. Pakistan's per hectare productivity was not commensurate. Yet, uh, your food productivity, our food productivity, our on-farm water management through World Bank assistance, at least in the province I'm from, I've seen a radical change. So, aid is not necessarily evil, it's how you apply it. Uh, if I share some success stories with you, addressing other issues, the motorway is a success story. Granted, 75% of Pakistani uses three-wheelers. Our 75% population, two or three-wheelers, the motorway can't be used. But your 25% have four-wheelers. The motorway is something that is successful. Commerce, domestic commerce is also necessary. I know nuclear program is a bit controversial, but if you give me $10 billion, which is the cost of that nuclear program, then you translate security or deterrence into some value. So I think it's a success. If you can fight a conventional war under a nuclear umbrella, I think that's successful because you don't resort to a nuclear war. The strategic dimension may jati, mass may jada nijaunga. Then Nadra, everybody uses Nadra. Uh, I went to get my family certificate the other day. It took me less than 20 minutes. Didn't have to call anybody. Just walked in, ticket went, windows khali the. Uh, dams, Indus Water Treaty. I think that's the most perfect example of a plan international involvement, and then dams being built. I know most of you weren't born, your parents get time, eh? but Tarbela, Mangla, that were built to this day, Pakistan benefits and the farmer benefits. So all aid is not necessary. And then if you're going to do defense production, again, that's an area where you can have a debate on whether it's a white elephant or not, but all the aid money you get for defense production ultimately gives you a product. Now, whether it's a white elephant or not is open debate, but it's utilized and defense has its own invisible value. Jahan tak corruption, tide aid ki or donor incentives ki baat hai. My humble opinion, Pakistan needs a bit of tough love from the donors. And jo mukhtalif captures hain, Dr. Ishad sahab baithe hain, inho ne uh, elite capture ki upar baut achha Pakistan ki economy ki pe likha hua hai. And he's been part of the government. So he can tell you ki jo operation reality, it's much more complicated. Essentially what the governments do are firefighting. And first responder. So agar aap mujh se poochhenge ki 35 saal mein mene kya sikha hai? Although I'm not rescue 1122, but our approach has been, ye aag bujao, is masle ko hal karo, mariz ko stabilize karke ambulance mein padao. Uske baad ambulance ko kaan leke jati hai, kya hota hai, kis kisam ka trauma hai, that's not our job. We stabilize the patient, put the patient in a neck brace, put him on a stretcher, put him in the ambulance, aur aag buja lete hai. Ab wo chemical fire hai, electrical fire hai, oil fire hai, wo baad mein dekhi jayegi, uski jame preventive fire prevention ki kya cheez hai karni chahiye, building ke fire codes honne chahiye. So unfortunately, Sivai ek government ke, civilian government ke, zyadatar governments apna teen ya char ya paanch saal nahi guzar sakti. With that constraint on a time frame, unke incentives perverse hote hain. Aur usi context mein saari aid chalti hai. Thank you. Thank you, Asad Saab. Uh, if you have, uh, Dr. Nasir has a question. Uh, we'll have this one last question before I uh, wrap it up. Yeah, thank you. Two comments are one that you were telling us that in the 60s and 70s, our planning was very good. But the question is that even when we were talking about planning, we were talking about the 60s and 70s, we were making our plan and we were executing it. Then there was a middle phase in which we had a donor with the donor. We sit together and try to design a plan. But now, the recent two decades have been going on, we have outsourced our intellectual to donors. So now they have the entire responsibility to come up with the plan. And we just sitting there to sign those plans. This is the one comment. The other thing, when we talk about BISP's success, we get the success of which we don't get. If the success is only to give in like a UCT to 9 million families, it's a good success. But if we look into the impact of those like stipend, then there is no success. So we have to define our success. Apai done a lot of work on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Naveed Saab or uh, Tobias, would you like to? But Naveed Saab, would you like to uh, comment on that? Especially since Dr. Anasa mentioned BISP. Ji, sure. Uh, so, of course, there are different parameters and metrics to uh, define what success is. Uh, and if you want to robust way of evaluation, karna chahe, toh, of course, you'll, you'll, you'll agree on certain parameters. But I, I think in a country where uh, social protection was uh, absent 
totally aur hum koi welfare state nahi hai there are indirect and inefficient ways of doling out welfare including sarkari naukriyan uh, so this is a i think a good enough system uh, agar aap bisp ko aaj khatam kar denge to what would happen to those uh, millions of families that you talked about of course they 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 should be able to graduate out of poverty and i think that's the that's the next plan that uh, government of pakistan is uh, sp- uh, particularly bisp is working on Uh, but and you also mentioned lack of capacity and uh, s- uh, outsourcing of capacity to consultants or development partners i think this takes us to the realm of civil service reform that byd and dr deem are particularly passionate about uh, o- over the years and certainly uh, assa saab is much better place to talk about that uh, we have seen how civil service has deteriorated uh, in a, in an environment where Uh, your senior civil servants are not sure how long are go- they going to stay in a particular ministry or in a, in a particular post how would you ensure continuity of any plan for that matter or implementation uh, so o- over the years there are so many problems because of which this has become re- really a wicked problem to deal with the problem of planning is not as simple as we like it to be thank you uh, to bias if you can have a quick comment on the outsourcing for outsourcing of intellectual uh, capabilities that dr nasir just said would you like to comment on that absolutely look i mean let me be honest i i have been in many rooms with governments agencies talking about planning processes and those plans have been developed by consultants or by development agencies and and they have represented the views of consultants and development agencies rather than the views of the government my advice to all pakistanis don't let that happen just don't let that happen ultimately a government plan should be a government plan it should reflect the views of the government normally the development partners come in and do this when when there isn't a plan and there isn't sufficient ownership and capacity or or commitment from government to develop its own plan that's why it's absolutely important that these plans really are developed by government that those plans are credible and that those plans can be put in front of development partners and government can say no this is what we want to do this is what we want you to get behind and we don't need a consultant or if we do need a consultant it's for technical advice but we are driving this plan we own this plan it belongs to us so don't let it happen that would be my advice thanks uh thank you i would uh, like to wrap it up but uh, i was just informed that dr shahid kardar has raised his hand again he wants to have a question so if uh, dr kardar if you can have a brief uh, uh, if you can have the uh, quick question please to comment on uh, the reference to bisp and nadir as an example part of the problem is these both these initiatives essentially did not hurt anyone who mattered so the political economy part was never affected so what i'm trying to emphasize is the issue has always been the political economy part the internal i can see and so these initiatives like bsp you know the even the dams as well as nadra now as soon as you start using the cnic for other interventions like say looking at the tax side and the potential on the revenue side suddenly you have a different animal to have to deal with so just emphasizing that these were successes largely because they really never hurt anyone uh thank you uh, dr sir uh would any panelists like to uh, comment on that or should i just wrap it up then i think the most important thing that we look at is the gap the gap is about 8.5% of our gdp that is the revenue expenditure gap and any entity can easily bridge that gap so as i said pakistan needs to reorient itself significant land reforms which is the most important thing because we're not a homogenous society so we can't use examples of korea or bangladesh uh, this is a heterogeneous mixed society uh, so you will have political economy issues but the most important thing is first of all meaningful land reforms so you have a equitable distribution and then taxation then you will address the gaps once you start addressing your three gaps your reliance on external financing will be diminished and that's the start of the road and for that the people sitting in islamabad and various political capital need to have the political will and lots of guts uh thank you ji thank you very much uh they came jo jab ye session when this session started and all out uh, and all through these days 
जितने भी दिनों में ये कॉन्फ्रेंस होगी दिस इज वॉट वी आर ट्राइंग टू डू नाउ यू गुड सी दैट ओपिनियंस डिफर ओवर हेयर आई शेयर माई फाइंडिंग्स एंड माई एक्सपीरियंस Asad Saab, then Tobias, and then Navid. They shared their own experience and all their own views. So views differ, and this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to bring to you different views, and kind of incentivizing you to ask questions, to query these things. So there is no 100% yes or uh, 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 no or black and white in all this thing, as you could have gauged from all this in conversation. But I really would like to thank my uh, panelists, Asad Saab. for sharing his uh, wonderful insights to bias and navid for being very honest in your opinions uh, about uh, donors and how do uh, they operate so i hope all of you enjoyed this conversation and please stay put for all the incoming conversations you uh, that would enrich your understanding of these critical issues thank you very much